Hey there, welcome to Broadcast to Post. I'm Jeff Sengpil, CTO at Keycode Media. This is the show where we interview leaders and experts in the AV, broadcast, and post-production spaces. We're giving you the inside tips to grow your media workflows and business today. Welcome to Broadcast to Post. I'm Steve Dupay with Keycode Media. On this episode, we will discuss the latest developments in IP 4K and cloud-based live production with an expert from Riedel Communications, Stephen Rimmick. Together, we'll explore the challenges and opportunities presented by aging baseband infrastructure transitioning to IP and hybrid environments, and share his insights on where the discussion on HDR is heading. We'll also take a deep dive into the current state of 4K in the production ecosystem, sharing um, his thoughts on the benefits and challenges of this emerging technology. It's Riedel, so I'm sure we'll talk about Intercom at some point too. Whether you're seasoned pro or just getting started in the world of live production, this is an episode you won't want to miss. Join us for a fascinating discussion of the cutting edge of broadcast technology, only on Broadcast to Post. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. It's great to be with you. Why don't you start with uh, telling us a little bit about some of the problems that uh, or key challenges that you see uh, broadcasters or other production professionals uh, facing today as they transition from baseband to IP-based uh, workflows, and how these uh, how these challenges can be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know a, a lot of the a, a lot of the challenges that we see um, people kind of face as they move forward into IP-based infrastructure is um, the the tools of that IP based infrastructure. So I think a lot of the times, you know, as engineers, we're used to the troubleshooting tools and the diagnostic criteria that we've been used to with SDI, with MADI, with AES3, with analog. And um, and we're used to all those things. And so now instead of, you know, maybe a cue box, maybe we have or or, you know, a um uh an SDI scope, we're using a uh, a native IP 2110 scope, and and that's kind of how we're troubleshooting our network. I think uh, a big factor of that is is kind of transitioning over into a knowledge base of IP and IP infrastructure. You know how these networks are connected together, how a lot of this um, how a lot of this world works in terms of that um, larger IT focused infrastructure, um, and I think that you know we've seen a very large um, transition to that over the past couple of years. And while we're still in, you know, maybe that gap between um, the early adopters and the mass early adopters, we're really starting to see that gap be bridged. Um, but again, like I said, I think it's a, I think a big piece of that puzzle is is the tools that you use as engineers to kind of facilitate a lot of that production. Yeah. And, you know, it, it kind of feels silly today um, to have a conversation about, you know, 4K and HDR and because they've kind of become the standard for streaming on Netflix shows and, and others. But it's still a little bit spotty when it comes to availability over cable and live TV. Where do you see us at in this inevitable transition of live TV into higher resolution formats using these new IP based tools? You know, I, I I totally agree. It's it's interesting to see that you know they've been very widely adopted on the consumer market, but not quite as adopted in um, in the the, the professional uh, production market quite as much. And I think a big part of that is definitely cost. Um, I think um, the what what I've been seeing a lot of, and what I've seen a lot of clients start to steer towards is production that doesn't necessarily specifically encapsulate 4k end-to-end -end workflows right you're not necessarily worried about oh every monitor in my facility needs to be 4k now you're worried a little bit more about like hey like this can be a 1080p display this can be a 1080p display how do we kind of proxy some of that um and and make it easier for our production and our facilities to be able to accommodate 4k workflows and i think uh with the advent of that with that becoming a, a a more common way to facilitate production that I think we're going to see a lot more 4k production, um, on the, on the broadcast production side. Interesting. Um, how is Riedel communications addressing that, this growing demand for IP based workflows and, and also cloud based workflows? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, if you, if you look at the history of Riedel, Riedel's very, um, vocal about, um, 
uh, a standards-based operation, standards-based production. Uh, we really like to focus on, you know, 2110 and making sure that we're adhering to those standards and NMOS and making sure that we're adhering to those. Um, you know, JTNM plays a really big part of of that as well. So this this body of manufacturers coming together, making sure that everything can can uh, talk to each other. But I think. Um, you know, a, a big thing is is with kind of the advent of our acquisition of Simply Live, um, you can see a lot of that uh, that workflow kind of start to be encapsulated and incorporated in a larger, you know, Riedel ecosystem, um, and and you know that kind of plays into the the previous conversation that we were having about kind of proxying information, right? So with us with a system kind of that's a little more cloud based, you have the ability for operators that are remotely located uh, to be operating off of a multi viewer that's 1080p or proxied SRT footage um, versus the actual production that's happening where the gear is happening, where the switching is happening, that's all happening at 4k. So you have a 4k deliverable, but you don't necessarily have to, to deal with all the, the, the heavy lifting from a production side of making sure everybody has that 4k. And, and that's, I think kind of what, that, that's some of the really exciting things that cloud-based infrastructure can, can provide for us on a day-to-day -day basis right now. You know? Sure. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned um, NMOS and uh, the, the activities that uh, JTNM is engaged in, because it's not just working in, in a silo with just your products. It's it's making sure that that connectivity across the whole breadth of the broadcast offering is working well together. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the benefits of, of taking that approach, being collaborative and cooperative with other manufacturers to ensure that the gear all works together? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's it's quite common to hear people talk about, um, you know, the frustrations of a multi-vendor environment, especially, you know, a couple of years ago when uh, when NMOS wasn't as fleshed out or widely adopted or um, 2110 wasn't as uh, universal, universally like adopted from all of the manufacturer's standpoints. And I think that's, uh, it's very interesting to see how many uh, how many people are coming to JTNM now? You know, three or four years ago, it was, you know, a handful of um, early adopters that wanted to be compliant to NMOS. They wanted to be compliant to 2110 in a, in a facet that made sense to everyone, not just like, oh, here's what the standard is. Let's adopt that standard. But here's what the standard is. Let's make sure that how everybody else is also adopting the standard is taken into account as well. Um, and it's very interesting. You know, I, I was fairly recently at at the most recent JTNM interop event, um, and quite a lot of vendors were there. I mean, pretty much everybody who's doing a 2110 workflow or an NMOS based workflow was there trying to test their products against that. And that's all available uh, publicly on the JTNM website. So if you're interested or anybody's interested in taking a peek at that, um, just Google uh, JTNM NMOS or JTNM 2110, and a page should come up with a nice big document that has a bunch of different manufacturers and how well they interrupt with basically all the rest of the manufacturers. So, yeah. Yeah. I actually uh, was working with a client uh, just a, a little while ago and we pulled up that document in a, in a presentation with executive staff and, and it, it showed the compatibility of different vendors and, and where they were at in, in the adoption and how well they had tested. And it was pretty revealing that, that the vast majority of people um, and products are, are really for lack of a better term, getting it together um, and yeah. and ensuring that that compatibility is is there. Um, what things should do? Do you think a um, a production or a broadcast professional should consider when choosing between IP baseband or hybrid workflows? Um, you know, I think I think budget is always going to play a really big part of that conversation, and and that's totally okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think a big piece of that puzzle too, when you're considering budget, is to consider how expandable a facility might be, right? So in five years, it we may you know we may get to a point where to interface with most trucks, it's you have to be 2110, or that 2110 is the easiest way to interface with a lot of trucks. Not saying that that's exactly what's going to happen, but like that's a theoretical you know, five-year picture. Um, and so having a high, you know, if, if budget constraints are a really big problem, then having a hybrid facility is a really, 
common solution for that because you can have some of the you can have some of the SDI, you can convert a lot of that into a 2110 environment. You can have all IP audio interfacing with all of that, have kind of all the positives and the flexibility and the modularity of an IP based workflow. Um, um, and and it's very easy to then incorporate 2110 workflows into that. And then you know as you as you grow and as you need more equipment, you can grow into 2110 specific equipment that doesn't have you know SDI spigots on it. It's just you know part of that 2110 network. Um, and I think so, oh sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say it's kind of just sitting there natively, so right. you're not you're not having to to add extra cards or do a bunch of conversion and add extra cost to the overall uh, yeah. solution to yeah. to be able to have the the benefits of of an IP workflow. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, I totally agree, and I, I think um, you know similar to like the cloud discussion in general, a lot of people are talking about how like you know cloud may not be for like useful to us right now in terms of like ROI um and so it really again that it, it depends on it depends on that 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 budgetary constraint and if if the ROI is good enough for cloud and if you're going to be able to take advantage of how flexible cloud is and i think a, a relatively similar conversation can be said for you know ip workflows in general 2110 workflows in general you know there's there there's ways to make 2110 routers that is uh, you know, a little more traditional, and there's ways to make a 2110 router that, you know, really takes advantage of like how flexible IP workflows are, and the how flexible the IT infrastructure surrounding a lot of the IP workflow is. And um, it's a pretty exciting thing to see a lot of clients when they when they get their head down and start to really develop their application, they can do some really really exciting things. Yeah, I you know that's it's, it's interesting you mentioned that you know the 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 infrastructure being able to leverage what the uh, IT world is doing. Um, years ago, when I was selling baseband routers, um, there was kind of the, a big push to make sure that you had redundant cross points and and redundant paths uh, here and there. But the the ultimate goal was to have fully redundant systems, if you will, so that right. from endpoint to endpoint, you, you could have duplicate paths so that you didn't run the risk of losing anything. And with the new infrastructure with Red Blue Networks and uh, 2022-7, we're able to do that in a more affordable way. Are, are you seeing that trend in general that that what, what used to be expensive to accomplish is now really in the realm of possibilities for um, critical path systems? Yeah, and and and... Yeah, I, I do see that to some extent. I think, and again, I think a big part of that is leveraging what the technology can do. And when you when you when you set up a system that really leverages the technology, it's invaluable, right? The cost analysis of of a lot of that stuff and how we can set up redundant paths and and how a lot of this gear is designed to be, you know, high availability um is has been a and it's been a concept in the IT world in, in in the networking world for quite a long time, well before you know we use like we in broadcast use the terminology high availability maybe when to refer to our our routers and our systems. And now you know we're kind of adopting workflows that are similar to what IT has has kind of already uh, been able to provide for us. And I think you know there's a lot to be said for for. Um, Taking existing technology that's been tried and true in the IT industry and leveraging it for us, not necessarily adopting our workflows to their workflows entirely, but to use that existing technology and modify it so that it works in tandem with our workflows so that we can take advantage of, you know, things like high availability, things like AB redundancy and 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 switch redundancy, you know, in general network topology redundancy and um, and how a lot of that kind of stuff works today. And I, I, it would be incomplete if I didn't ask you a little bit about uh, the some of the clever solutions that that Riedel has in terms of, of being able to get from baseband to IP and IP back to baseband and, and to, to to other formats as well, whether it's HDMI, uh, um, getting your audio in and out um, of the system. You, you want to talk a little bit about the? I, I I just love the Fusion solution. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I mean. Um... Yeah, I think the idea behind a lot of that kind of stuff is to allow is to create a create a world where the infrastructure is as small and as transparent as possible, right? So, um, you know, the idea behind a lot of the MeteorNet 
IP product line, which is, you know, these, these Muon SFPs that, um, some are placeable in chassis and switches and, um, infrastructures like that. That's supposed to be this kind of bulk, you know, location. It's, but it's supposed to be very transparent, right? It's very easy to integrate. You toss it right into your core infrastructure. It connects right back up to your core switches and stuff like that. Whereas the fusions are very transparent in a similar way, but on kind of the endpoints, right? So instead of having large gateway devices um, that aggregate a lot of signals, you've got a smaller gateway device that you can put right on the back of a monitor and take uh, monitors that are normally HDMI or normally SDI and kind of convert them in a, a very like rudimentary way into a 2110 monitor. You're running fiber directly out to it. Um, you can run your multi-viewers straight out to that. And it really kind of extends the infrastructure and the flexibility of that IP-based workflow into something that's a little bit more hybrid, a little more palatable um, when it comes to maybe like a, a brownfield um, deployment versus like greenfield deployment stuff like that sure. and obviously there's a lot of applications for greenfield as well but um but it makes it really palatable for the folks that uh are, are trying to brownfield a facility and kind of extend that that infrastructure and leverage that ip infrastructure perfect makes perfect sense and that kind of leads into the the next question i have for you is um how do you see the role of production technology evolving in the next few years um, to, to solve additional problems? And what are some of the most exciting developments that you see on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, uh, the like the the idea of cloud is really exciting. Um, I understand that, that that is a little bit of a buzzword. I think that's going to be a very big talking point at NAB. Um, but it is really exciting. I mean, the flexibility of cloud um, and what it allows us to do in terms of um, in terms of like scaling our resources, right? So, you know, it, a lot of times people talk about it with like elections and stuff like that. There may be one time a year where you have to spin up a lot of resources, a lot of production resources, a lot of switching, a lot of replay, a lot of whatever it is. Um, and you don't necessarily want to pay for all that gear ad hoc and you don't want to rent it and then integrate it and then pull it right back out and send it back to the rental house. Um, Instead, there's this concept of like this scalable workflow, right? So you can have cloud-based infrastructure, whether that's a private cloud where you have your own data center or, you know, AWS instances or even like on-prem hardware that is scalable from like a licensing perspective. Um there's this concept of uh, you know scale it up for a couple days and then scale it back down and so now you're you, it makes it really cost effective and there's a lot of ROI associated with that and I, there you know that's that's kind of a, one of those not to kind of go down a rabbit hole but that's kind of one of those conversations when it comes to ROI a lot of people you know it was just at the venue summit for SVG and there was a conversation about um, there's a conversation about you know, ROI and and CapEx versus OpEx. And a lot of people are very concerned with how much higher their OpEx is in their CapEx if they kind of go into a cloud-based infrastructure. And a lot of times that first year, you might not see that ROI when you initially invest in something like this. But what you do see later down the line is the flexibility that provides you kind of, uh, it, it increases that ROI rather significantly as you kind of move down sure. the line. Yeah, and, 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 and of course, there's other, other benefits that, aren't quite as easy to capture um, with uh, virtualized remote production, right. um, reducing the T&E, um, having, having the same talent doing the shows all the time um, and, and having those, that having that talent at home and rested and fed and, and ready to go the next day for the next show. Oh yeah. Uh, kind of some unseen advantages to, yeah. to, to being able to do that kind of production. Yeah. It certainly makes it a lot easier to do Remy model kind of stuff when it's all you know, in the cloud. So, right. Well, that kind of leads to the next one. And this is a chance to, you know, if you, if, if you, if you want to put out some teasers for some new things that you might be introducing at NEB this year, um, are there some interesting challenges that you guys are, are uh, working on solving today and, and some things that you want to hit at that uh, maybe you've recently released or plan to announce um, uh, as we head into NEB? Yeah. I mean, I think the big story for us is going to be Simply Live. You're going to see a lot of Simply Live. Simply Live is going to be a lot closer to our booth, um, just right next door. We're going to be incorporating a lot of their infrastructure into our infrastructure. So that's going to be a very big talking point. Um, 
And um, it, it, like I said, we're really excited to kind of welcome uh, welcome them on to the to, to the Riedel, into the Riedel family. Um, a lot of their technology is extremely uh, well developed, and we're really excited on how how we're going to continue to implement that. Um, yeah, I think in terms of NAB 2023, I definitely said it before, but I think cloud is going to be a big, huge talking point. I think we may talk a little bit about AI. You may see a couple people with AI-driven workflows and stuff like that. But um, but at um, at VidTrans uh, a couple weeks ago, the big talking points were definitely cloud and you know, and and honestly, uh, oddly enough, five G private five G network. So like remote production through like you know in, in like in farther off areas and stuff like that. So I think those are kind of like, those seem to be the through threads of the year. It's kind of kind of coming up to NAB might be what we're talking a lot about at NAB. Outstanding. Well, this has been enjoyable having a quick conversation with you. I, I appreciate your insights, and uh, I think our audience uh, uh, can will have learned something about IP and, and and where the market is going, and and how cloud can be of a, a benefit. So, uh, thanks so much for joining with us today. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I, re- I really appreciate it. Key Code Media, AV Broadcast Post Production, keeping you ahead of technology. So now we're at the fun part uh, where we're live with uh, Steve and we're gonna Steven and we're gonna ask uh, some questions from uh, you folks watching this uh, this uh, session. And uh, let's start out with uh, this one from uh, Bill on social media. Um, he's asking, uh, besides the, the pandemic, what are the key factors that are affecting the transition to IP and cloud-based workflows, and what impact is that having on the overall industry? Stephen, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, I think. Um... On the pandemic, I think the pandemic kind of pushed us definitely, you know, we've talked at length about that over the past couple of years, about how the pandemic's kind of pushed us into more remote workflows, more IP-centric infrastructure. And I think a lot of times we've started to leverage existing technology in the IT sector, and that's kind of pushed us even farther into that, where we've found, you know, management software that allows us to manage these large-scale IP installations or um, uh uh, like Grafana and stuff like that, like existing technologies that are really easy to to manage and monitor uh, installations with. And that's kind of allowed us to really push the envelope of of what we can do in a broadcast environment um, when we have access to some of those tools. Are there, are there other factors that are kind of driving it um, besides just this this need to, um, when there's a government shutdown or some national emergency to, to work remotely, are there other key factors that are motivating uh, folks to, to go to remote production? I, I definitely think there is. I, I think, you know, um, the, there's, I mean, cost wise, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, you're not having to travel people everywhere across the globe. You're not having to expend all this money and resources to kind of wear those people out. And, and they're a lot more accessible at, at specific times. I know, like, working from home, I end up being a little bit more accessible. Um, rather than when I'm traveling and when I'm actually in the office and working on this kind of stuff. And so I think that kind of plays into the uh, into that a lot, especially the cost savings, right? You're, you have less equipment at a specific one large location. Now you have multiple smaller locations that you can kind of um, facilitate, especially with that remote workflow, that, that kind of stretching of the IP infrastructure and what it can do for us. I think that really helps us there. Cool. Uh, it kind of ties into the next question from Jane. Um, uh, she's asking uh, if with the rise in uh, remote production and distributed workflows, what are the key considerations that uh, broadcasters and production uh, professionals need to keep in mind to accomplish um, the same level of, of production quality that they've had in the past? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a, some of that we covered in the in the um in the interview, but I think a big part of that is like having the right tools of the trade to kind of uh, work through and troubleshoot items within like an IP infrastructure, within a cloud-based infrastructure. Um, you know, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of work that like the VSF has done with um, different encoding uh, mechanisms and different um, different like standardizations that we're kind of pushing towards to make sure that we can leverage you know, WAN technology and cloud-based technology and still have, you know, a really solid image at the end of the day, really solid production 
um, and and have kind of a nice end to end uh, workflow through cloud based or IP based productions. Cool, and that that kind of ties into the next one I have here from uh, from Matt. Um, when you're doing remote productions, the complexity level obviously goes up because now you're dealing with different time and space areas. Um, how are you managing that for comms, for multi views, for all those? feedback elements that make it possible for the talent producing the event to really be successful? Yeah, I, you know, I think um, a lot of that, especially with Intercom, a lot of that has been being very, uh, you know, standards driven. That's been a really big part of, of that piece, right? Because when you're standards driven, it's really easy to interoperate. It's also uh, very easy to, for instance, like some of the panels that we have, have like a, they have, they can remove some of the PTP off of their stream that they have going from the panel to the frame. So that makes it really easy to put a, um, a panel in somebody's house and have it work just like a normal panel, really high quality PCM based audio. Um, but it allows them to kind of work remotely. So I think making the, a big piece of a big piece of the puzzle there is making sure that from an end user standpoint, not much has changed from a workflow uh, standpoint. They still have the same thing that they're used to, either a panel um, or some kind of communication that makes it really easy to to talk back and forth between their producer and their staff and their talent and kind of stuff like that. And and you know everybody thinks that you know there's going to be a huge amount of latency involved with this. What what has your experience been in terms of of either the the actual latency that occurs or is that more myth than than reality? You know, I, it, it's it's really going to depend. It depends on a lot of factors. But in reality, when you're using you know some of these like low latency um, codecs and um, transport mechanisms like PCM, you know, un PCM is an uncompressed, very low latency, typically um, mechanism, uncompressed mechanism. And um, so a lot of that stuff with the advent of, you know, where the, in where we are with like internet connectivity in normal homes right now has really exploded over, especially over the past, you know, five to 10 years. So it's like, I have a gig down and like 50 up here at my house and from here to Valencia, I'm, I live in Denver. From here to Valencia, it's like 50 milliseconds. So I think there's a there's a lot of complexity to that. Obviously, with like certain VoIP mechanisms, certain more like heavily compressed mechanisms, you start to really uh, lean into latency. But a lot of the compression that we're implementing and the VSF is implementing and we're kind of pushing towards is all extremely low latency. And you really just have to deal with, you know, your latency to a data center, right? Which can be as low as like 10 to 15 milliseconds. And, you know, at, at its longest from coast to coast, you're looking at with a decent internet connection, you're looking at like 100 milliseconds of latency. And that's not even jittered. That's just latency. So, you know, I think we're getting to a point where it's a lot more accessible to do some of these remote workflows, even without the use of like a business circuit, stuff like that. That being said, business circuits are definitely the way to go. And even more so the way to go is like MPLS or a managed connection between two facilities. Sure. So, so depending on the, the cost of your production um, and or the, the, the return value that you have for, for the production, you need to take a look, a careful look at, at how you're going to manage that, that connection uh, fabric to maximize the deliverables that you have so that you minimize any errors or, or conditions. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that kind of ties into another question here uh, from Andy. Um, he's he's asking, you know, what are some of the biggest misconceptions or myths around 4K and HDR, and how broadcasters and production professionals can make informed decisions when it comes to adopting these technologies? And of course, that kind of leads into: do we use traditional methodologies like um, SDI, um, or do we use that as a transition point to IP? You want to talk a little bit about those myths and misconceptions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times what we see um, is kind of a proxied approach where uh, you have a lot of pieces in the middle that aren't HDR, aren't 4K, monitoring, um, multi-viewing and stuff like that, where, whereas your product and the, the, the line of um, the line going to the switcher and then your deliverable ends up being 4K or HDR, but a lot of the stuff that you're monitoring isn't. And what that does is it it creates a really nice uh, pocket where you remove a lot of the cost of HDR and 4K being everywhere in at every facet of the facility. But that's a really nice thing when it comes to like IP is it's a little bit easier to kind of mix and match 
um, endpoints and stuff like that and and break apart signals in an IP uh, workspace with IP-based um, uh, devices that are taking in 2110 streams, breaking them down and then sending them out. So you can proxy that and get to like different kinds. Uh, I think that, that 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 kind of ties into some of one of the other the other big misses that um, the cost of going to the cloud or the cost of going to IP is just prohibitive, um, mm -hmm. and it's time you get it, it, it's best to just wait uh, until the the future until it's all settled. You know, be a be a, a mid to late adopter rather than being an early adopter. Mm -hmm. Find that to be the case, or uh, you know, I it, it, it's going it's definitely going to be driven by budget, but at the same time, I think there is a lot. There's a lot to be said for moving towards an IP uh, an IP workspace and a, and a, or or a cloud based workspace and a lot of what that provides you is flexibility right the flexibility of where your endpoints are how they're connected to your system in what way they're connected to your system especially when it kind of comes to like cloud based infrastructure um, and a lot of times what we'll see is that maybe the ROI, because you know, we've talked a lot about ROI um, in terms of cloud-based infrastructure, in terms of IP-based infrastructure, 2110 infrastructure. But um, a lot of times what we see is that you might not see that ROI day one, and you might not see that ROI that first year, but where you really start to see the return on investment with that is as you expand and as you spin things up and spin things down, and as you need to like, hey, we need somebody to go to this stadium and spin up this little bit of like IO here. That's going to be really hard to do if you're not already kind of set up to do that. But if you have some cloud-based infrastructure, like a little bit of cloud-based infrastructure mixed in and like are mostly IP-based, it's going to be really easy to just drop something at that endpoint and link it all back and have it work very seamlessly. So I think, um, you know, we're seeing that transition, but like we're seeing a lot of people in kind of a transition point of that 60-40 IP and cloud to like standard SDI in a facility or even 7030 um, as they're trying to transition out of out of baseband SDI and into like a more cloud-based flexible model. That makes that makes sense. And that it, it's it's kind of hard to quantify that flexibility and scalability until you you're in a crunch where you've got a, a new production that you need to do. And um, there's there's certainly revenue potential there, but if you if you have a locked in infrastructure that you can't scale or rent or expand like you can do with right. the cloud, then you're you're going to miss out on those opportunities. So there's an opportunity loss cost. Um, yes, in yeah. there, and that mix as well. I think that's it's, it's interesting when I when I talk with customers um, and we we kind of look at you know, that balance between traditional SDI infrastructures and uh, IP-based and cloud-based infrastructures, um, we we oftentimes look at that total cost of ownership. What's it going to take to to get it instantiated today? If you start to add those factors up, you find that there's some real advantages to, uh, if you're going to expand your system to, to migrating earlier to, to some of these, uh, to the IP technologies, or in the case of the cloud, to not having to put physical infrastructure in. So that, that total yeah. cost of ownership applied um, with along with a return on investment over a, a three-year term, I think I, I found with customers, uh, gives them a better picture of where where things can land. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. And, and, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll take that time too to say like NMOS and the, like the, um, the interoperability is a huge factor in that total cost of ownership, right? So with the advent of IP-based video and 2110 and adding adding in the cost of like pulling all that kind of stuff, having your control system be rather agnostic to the devices that you're adding on really helps to make it very easy and flexible and add to that, you know, add to the, uh, lower the total cost of ownership quite significantly. That, excellent. I know that's, that's a perfect segue to this, uh, this next question I'm going to pick here. Um, from Chase, um, we've had a, a tremendous run in the broadcast industry um, and all the related industries um, that utilize our technologies um, with SDI because it is just like bulletproof interoperability. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know that when you, you connect those BNC ends on a piece of cable, that things things are going to work right as long as your cable is yeah. good. Um, right. You mentioned NMOS. We talked about twenty one ten. Um, how does Riedel Communications approach interoperability with other vendors and technologies? What are you seeing going on in the industry? And are we are we as good as SDI? Um, are we going to be better than SDI? Where, where do you see things at right now? 
Well, yeah. So I, I, I can answer that. It's definitely, I'll, I'll start to answer that in the like in the interoperability side of things. Like, I think Riedel, Riedel wants to be extremely Riedel's standpoint. You know, for a very long time, has been very standards driven, very open and uh, agnostic to who we're talking to and how we're talking to them, and and that's why we're we try to be so, so as standards based as possible. Because if we're adhering as closely as we possibly can to the SEMTI specifications and to the the VSF recommendations and the NMOS recommendations, then it's going to be really easy to take our device, plug it into a switch, take somebody else's device, plug it into a switch, and we're going to be able to talk to each other really quickly. And you know, we're we're definitely getting to that point. Like we're getting to that point where there's it's really easy to just toss things on a network and have them talk to each other with an NMOS registry in between. Um, whereas, you know, like admittedly, you know, we're we're in we've we're starting to bridge the gap between the early adopters and the late early adopters and stuff like that. And and that that has been a problem in the past where you know one person's interpretation of something is different than another person's interpretation of something. And that's where organizations like JTM, which was I believe previously mentioned, um, come in where it's like, hey, let's all get down to nitty gritty and put our stuff on a network and see if it works. And if it works, then great, we get the thumbs up and everybody's happy. You can download that doc on the on online; it's super easy to get to. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of like better than SDI, worse than SDI, I think we're different than SDI, obviously, and and and. And there's a lot of necessity to move into a, like a more flexible um, standardization, which is kind of where 2110 came from in terms of how flexible it is in terms of ease of use, in terms of like adding feature, adding things and removing things and making it really uh, size scale, scalable. But there's also a lot of stuff in the IT world a lot of software and uh, standardization that's happened in the IT world that's being adopted into 2110 and into video over IP. And we're using that to our advantage as opposed to being told, hey, do it this way. You have to do it this way. So we're taking our existing workflows, adapting them to IP, and then taking other people's software, other industry standardizations, um, and adapting that to our workflows, like Grafana, like, you know, a network monitoring and like Zabbix and stuff like that. These are all like monitoring and, and, um, and vis like visualization kind of um, softwares. That's one of the key concerns with a, a, a larger, more complex system is we're used to having nice drawings that show exactly where the cables go. And in an IT-based um, infrastructure, um, those cables kind of disappear. Um, we end up with we end up with aggregated links that uh, that tie all this stuff together, and not knowing exactly where that signal lives. It 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 all works. But it's not; it doesn't have the same degree of physical confidence that, uh, that those hardline drawings had in the past. So knowing knowing where things are connected, being able to go troubleshoot, I think is is really helpful. Um, are there specific solutions um, from Riedel that uh, you want to you want to talk about that are helping to make this all possible? Um, you know, I, like I think with our acquisition of Simply Live, that's been a really big key player into this, but also like. Just uh, a lot of our products use um, either SNMP or RESTful API, and a lot of that is very easily incorporated into larger, you know, systems like this. RESTful API is a very common um, API for um, like talking between multiple vendors and devices. Um, it's stuff that like Netbox can do. You can write scripts within Netbox to go out and reach out to the network and kind of discover things and pull them into the database. There's even people who've written scripts to take what's in Netbox and put it out towards other devices. So I think, uh, like a lot for us, a lot of that exists in the like agnosticity, I guess. If that's a, I don't even know if that's a word, but um, of uh, our purchase of Simply Live, it really helps to kind of show where we're kind of moving in terms of cloud-based infrastructure and kind of like an open, um, you know, more. Uh, um, uh, like Docker-based, container-based kind of environment. Okay. Um, another question here we've got uh, from Mike um, is, with the increasing importance of data and analytics in live production, what kind of tools and technologies do you see emerging to help broadcasters and production professionals make more uh, informed decisions in real time? Mm, yes. Yeah, that's, a, that's definitely 
uh, a big factor. We see that a lot with obviously, you know, Zabbix and stuff like Zabbix and Solar Winds. Um, going into like a Grafana dashboard is really nice, but you're probably looking at things 60, 60 seconds behind. And this is where we see a lot of like software defined networking kind of come into play because a lot of software defined networking having handles into the network having communication with a lot of that kind of stuff and the incorporation that's possible with an SDN into a broadcast controller. I think we see a lot of that becoming a very important factor of that because again, you know, the broadcast controller can incorporate a lot of its own analytics, its own metrics, its own reporting so that very quickly you can say, Hey, link three went down, you know, 27 milliseconds ago, like, should we do anything about that? And then within a lot of these, you know, playbooking softwares and, and uh, broadcast controllers and SDNs, you can write your own kind of scripts to that, right? So it's like, hey, if this, if this port goes off um, for X amount of time, switch, o move this stream over to this stream, right? So that's a very large, uh, that's a very large factor of like, you know, high availability is a, con is a very common concept within the IT world that we're kind of adopting here in, in terms of a, in, in, in terms of broadcast controllers and SDNs and um, and stuff like that. So, Great. Well, um, I, we've gone through all the questions that we've received so far. So um, is there anything else you'd like to share um, that we haven't, we haven't covered? Um, not particularly, I will say, uh, we'll, we will be at, um, we will be at NAB. So please come see us in NAB booth C4910. Um, we'll have a nice little section of, um, of a Riedel booth and a nice little section of a Simply Live booth that'll kind of be incorporated into each other. So that's kind of our story there is with that. So. Excellent. Well, I sure appreciate your time uh, doing this interview and answering these questions, Stephen, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at NAB. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you all for joining our, uh, our podcast today. And uh, we look forward to helping you with your IP and cloud-based solutions in the future. Remember, Key Code Media is, is expert at doing these technologies and can provide uh, uh, significant value-added solutions for you and your customers. Thanks all for joining. Thanks for watching Broadcast to Post. Please make sure to subscribe to the podcast to receive future episodes. Follow Key Code Media on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram to receive news on additional AV, broadcast, and post-production technology content. See you next time, folks.